In this week's lecture material, we're going to be looking at river systems. And by river systems, as is indicated by the real world questions, we are looking at things as diverse as what's called the watershed of a river to the way that water moves through that watershed and also the types of landforms that are found in river areas as well. The first concept is the concept of a drainage basin or watershed, which is the geographic area that water falls into that ultimately finds its way into a stream. I've asked you as part of the real world questions to identify which watershed you live in. If you live in the Anchorage area, there's a map posted on Blackboard. If you don't, you can do research to find out what watershed you do live in, or you could just look at UAA's watershed. A watershed, again, is this geographic area, and it's divided from another geographic area by the height of land. Water that flows through this watershed can happen on the surface, uh, in through sheets, it can go through little gullies or what are called rills, but it also moves underground as well as the water moves its way down into the saturated zone and eventually into the river. Streams have different drainage patterns as well, and this is a diagram taken from the text that shows different types of drainage patterns that you should look at and research as you complete the physical geography assignment. It will require you to think a little bit about the basic geology that's and the geography that underlies the area you're examining. Streams are said to have a gradient, which refers to how steep they are. That can change over time and over distance, but ultimately streams are of course flowing from the height of land down to what's called the base level of the stream, which could be a lake or an ocean, or in the case of exotic streams, streams that occur in desert areas, just the open desert where they evaporate. Stream discharge refers to the amount of water that is moving through the stream at any one time or place. Stream discharge changes over the course of a stream. Usually up high in the source of a stream, the discharge is relatively small. And as the stream grows and gets more tributaries, it becomes larger and more and more water is flowing through that. The exception is in these exotic streams. The velocity of streams will also change over distance as well. When they're high tumbling over mountains, they can often be very fast. But in lowlands, there can often be a lot of water moving through an area, often very quickly, particularly during times of flood. The turbulence of a stream will generally decrease. Up high, again, it's moving quickly down steep slopes. The water is very turbid. But as it starts to move into lowland areas, it begins to slow down and meander. And this also means it doesn't have as great of a capacity, as I'll talk about in a second. Stream discharge will di change over time as well. Generally, a stream has what's referred to as a base flow, which is sort of the average amount of flow that goes through it. But after a major precipitation event, water will flow over the surface and through the soil and will increase that flow to a peak flow that will slowly discharge over time. And as you'll see, not only in diagrams in this lecture, but on the Google Earth videos that you are to examine, streams change and vary so much um, that there can be a lot of different ways that stream discharge works. Here's a diagram that just shows the basic idea of stream discharge. Precipitation occurs, that leads to a peak flow, and then eventually that flow begins to decrease to go back to the stream's base flow. Here are a couple of examples. This is a small creek called Sugar Creek. Note that its um, peak flow takes place sometime around December 20th or 21st, meaning that precipitation was occurring probably on the 19th and 20th. That river feeds into the Wabash River at Mount Carmel, where you'll see the peak flow is significantly later because the Wabash is collecting water from a large number of tributaries. Even further down is the Ohio River where the peak flow is many days later 
again because the Ohio River is collecting water from a large number of drainage basins and may not even show the amount of discharge that has peaked in the Wabash. Another example taken from Nevada is a small wash called the Meadow Valley Wash. You'll notice that its base flow is very small, just one cubic foot per second. But after a precipitation event takes place, it looks like on maybe October 19th, it increases almost three times, 3,000 times rather. Desert areas tend to have very responsive um, creeks that show very steep peak flows because there's so little vegetation to absorb the moisture. Rivers found in more subtropical areas with a great deal of vegetation and very low elevations as well like the Suwannee River in Florida, have very strange looking peaks compared to what we see in other places. What's happening as water flows through the creek is not only that it's just moving its way down to the base level, but it's also engaged in erosion and deposition because as a stream moves through its channels, it will move faster or slower and as it does that, its velocity will change and it will be able to erode more through hydraulic action. And it will also be able to pick more material up if it's moving faster because there'll be greater turbidity in the water. <clears throat> Streams will also cause erosion through what's called abrasion. Abrasion takes place when little bits and pieces of material or even large boulders are pushed hydraulically through the channel causing more erosion to take place. The amount of material that is being transported by a stream includes very fine particles that are dissolved and in the water, slightly larger pieces that are suspended just by the hydraulic force of the river, as well as material that is pushed along the very bottom of the bed called its bed load. Streams are obviously going to have a greater or lesser ability to transport material depending on how big they are and how fast they're moving. Very fast moving streams can often move very large amounts, uh, very large pieces of material. But if they're not really huge rivers, they might not have a huge amount of stuff being moved. A really huge river, like the Mississippi River, for example, might not have a lot of large material in it, but might be carrying an incredible amount of material simply because there's so much water in it. This is referred to as the competence of the stream, how big materials can be carried, versus the capacity, which refers to um, how much actually is being pushed through. It's also worth noting that floods cause a lot of extra competence and capacity and a lot of scouring out that takes place in the bed of the stream. As streams begin to <clears throat> slow down and as they start to decrease their gradient and get closer to their, um, to their final destination, they begin to meander back and forth across the landscape. There are several types of um, stream channels that are created as a stream is relatively graded like this. If they're carrying a large amount of material that is very regularly deposited, they might have many threads or channels, like braided channels, like you see in glacial streams, simply because so much material is moving through it. In an area that doesn't have large amounts of material, the channels tend to be single thread and meander back and forth. When they do that, they have very predictable landforms associated with them, including banks that are undercut by river meanders and other places called point bars where material is deposited. Take a look at the diagrams in the text to help you understand these. Some of the really interesting things that are associated with these meandering channels is that they often have scars that show where meanders used to be because the meanders grow and shrink over time. And sometimes they completely cut off a part of the channel, forming something called an oxbow lake. And we can see how that process would take place in this diagram right here. 
In addition to these landforms, there are a lot of other landforms that are associated with streams. Um, one thing that often happens, especially when an area is tectonically lifted upwards in a faulted area, is that rivers will become entrenched deep into an area that was lifted upwards. And you'll get these interesting looking canyons, whether it's in a desert area or in a humid area where a stream sort of digs right down into the geology with its meanders in place. Sometimes rivers will flow over faulted areas and um, as they fall over will form waterfalls. Those waterfalls, as they move their way back, can often form interesting features called nick points. Again, this is something that you can look at in more detail in the text. In some places where large numbers of streams and rivers fall over from one sort of geology to another, there'll be a line of rapids um, in a geographic area all along numerous rivers. This is referred to as fall lines, and there's a very famous one in the eastern part of the United States. But some of the other more common depositional landforms include the floodplains that are formed by streams as they meander back and forth, as well as something called a natural levee. A natural levee is formed because when a stream floods, it immediately drops a lot of its load when it leaves its banks. This means that really big rivers tend to have areas built up right along the sides of the river. And then as you move your way away from the river, the elevation gets lower and lower and swampier as well. These back swamp areas are sometimes filled by rivers of their own called Yazoo streams, which run parallel to the main river. That's a feature seen in streams and rivers all across the world. You also get bars and swales and meander scars, the things that um, you saw in the previous um, diagram that showed um, the formation of, um, of meanders in a stream area. There are other features, including alluvial terraces, that are areas that are built up by old meanders that eventually get cut down into by newer streams. And then rivers also form deltas as well. Deltas are where they finally reach their destination and their base level, and when they do that, they hit an area of still water and immediately lose large amounts of their load. These deltas can look different depending on where they are. Sometimes they form beautiful arc-shaped deltas, but sometimes they also form these tiny little deltas that stick out in the water called bird's foot deltas. Again, you can look at examples of these in the text. Here's a diagram that shows the nick point of Niagara Falls as it goes over a faulted area called the Niagara Escarpment um, that separates Lake Erie from Lake Ontario. This is a diagram that shows a floodplain of a large river with oxbow lakes, old meander scars, and then the bluffs that surround it that are terraces built up by old streams. You can see that this stream has natural levees on it and back swamps, and that it sits on top of a large amount of what are called alluvial deposits. Alluvial deposits are the deposits left behind by streams. This is a great old map that shows meander scars, and to the right is a satellite image where you can see that sort of superimposed next to it. Um, a large river like the Mississippi River meanders back and forth and frequently cuts itself off, forming new oxbows and new channels. Here's another map that shows more oxbow lakes along the Tallahatchie River. You can also see meander scars appearing in the contour lines behind it, as well as little alluvial terraces that have been formed by the old rivers. And here is a classic example of what's called an alluvial fan. An alluvial fan is essentially a delta, but it's a delta that shows up in a desert area. 
when a small stream in a desert area comes flooding very quickly out of the mountains like that one we saw near Caliente, Nevada. That material very quickly is deposited as the water disperses into the flat areas surrounding it. And over time, the stream will move back and forth across the landscape, forming many small channels, but also this great big fan-like shape. If that fan-like shape were in a much larger river and were much lower in elevation as well, it would form a delta, like the beautiful Arcate Delta of the Nile River. So these are all some things for you to explore. You will be looking at streams in the physical geography assignment as well by using Google Earth to look at polygons that show large watersheds and then lines that show the positions of rivers and streams within that polygon. You'll be able to click them off and on so that you'll be able to study them a little bit and also get a sense for some of the drainage patterns that you see in that area. As always, I am happy to help if you have any questions.